You are watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Philippians chapter number one. If you would turn there with me very quickly. We welcome you all to our life class this morning. Jesus told us in John 10 that he has come that we might have life and life more abundantly. And that's what we're seeking for today is life more abundantly. Let's read verse number six, Philippians one, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being confident of this thing, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We welcome you all today and uh, we thank you for joining with us to exalt the name of our Lord Jesus. Uh, I, I want to start with a, uh, an idea that you will find echoed again and again in the scripture. Uh, but we oftentimes, I think, at some level miss uh, the, the importance of it. And that is this idea that um, obedience is be- better than sacrifice. You will find this, of course, in the story of the kings. You will find this also again echoed in the prophets. And you will, of course, find this again in the Gospels. Uh, this idea that uh, obedience really is the highest sign of a devotion to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said it this way, if you love me. Uh, keep my commandments. And uh, it's so interesting to note what he could have said. He could have said, if, if you would have eternal life, keep my commandments. He could have said, if you want to avoid eternal judgment, keep my commandments. But he didn't phrase it that way at all. He phrased it this way. Uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, There is a Chinese proverb that says, A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor man perfected without trials. Uh, This isn't an encouraging thought. This isn't profoundly encouraging whatsoever. But there is a truth here that we wouldn't want to rush past. Amen? Amen. In the same manner that uh, iron sharpens iron, In the same manner that friction polishes a gem, uh, humanity, each one of us, our faith, our endeavor to please God with our lives, our endeavor to walk with Him, it cannot be perfected without the friction in our life. Yes, even the trials and the temptations that are in our life. Can I have a half-hearted amen? Amen. Some of you did better. Thank you for going the extra mile there. Uh, Paul says this, I'm sure of this, uh, the one who began a good work in you is going to complete that good work in you. Uh, I, I, let me just reference this, I won't take time, I'm going to teach it and preach it later on. Uh, we can make the mistake of thinking of God's kingdom and God's people in the terms of a club. What I mean by that is a club has membership rules. Uh, that if you do not abide by those rules, uh, they will in some manner exclude you from the club. It's a model of, of obedience, this club model of obedience. If you don't abide by the rules of the club, you get excluded, kicked out of the club. Uh, you will not find the club model uh, anywhere in the Word of the Lord. What you find in the Word of the Lord is a family model. That's not the same thing. Now, sometimes we err in our zeal to convince uh, others or perhaps even our children um, that it's a club model. And you won't find that anywhere in the Word of the Lord. What you find in the Word of the Lord, and I don't have time for this today, but I want you to think about it. You find a family model. What is the difference? In a club model, you are excluded. In a family model, you are chastened. The Lord does not give up. And sometimes we err by creating a culture, a subtle culture of people who are not where they should be, that they do not belong. You do not find that in the Word of the Lord. I know this is a stretch for some of you, and I didn't intend to start out by making you uncomfortable this morning. Forgive me. 
But I want us to understand the, the, the model of obedience and love that you see in the Word of the Lord. Uh, you don't find exclusion. What you find, uh, what you find is chastening. And so uh, the Lord, starting all the way in Genesis, when sin comes, what does He do? Well, He kills them all starts them, and, just, and just ends the experiment. No, that's not what happens. He chastens them. Uh, and yet he tries again with humanity. Even in the great judgments like the flood, uh, he finds a reset, a restart. With the great transgressions of Israel, he finds a reset. He finds a restart. And although generations may rebel, he keeps, he keeps resetting and restarting. <clears throat> God help us not to be the kind of believer who we... We, we, without meaning to, we start ascribing to this idea of those who are approved and those who are disapproved, those who are in and those who are out. That's not a biblical idea. Uh, I've seen in some cases um, a churches exclude their young people when their young people went through uh, carnal times as if you did not go through a carnal time. It's been my experience that some of the people who are the harshest on young people didn't even serve the Lord when they were that age. They were out in the clubs. But they will be the hardest on the young people who are still trying. You should believe that the Lord knows how to chasten His beloved. And you should believe that the Lord knows how to draw them. And I, I would say even further that there are people who should be in the should be in churches across America right now. But they were they they, they felt exclusion. From people who should have been patient. We are not exclusion agents. Thank God. Amen. And so the Lord who began a work in you, He will complete the work. Yes, it is possible to push the Spirit of the Lord away. Yes, it is possible. That's free will. But that does not change the nature of the kingdom of God. That does not change the nature of the love of God. Everyone here today who are prayed through right now, there's been seasons in your life where you were far from the Lord and the Lord did not exclude you. But every day he went to look and see if the young fool would come back to the house of his father. And when the young fool returns, God throws a party. The Lord's working on all of us. And there are aspects of spiritual growth we should not deceive ourselves over. I want to say to everyone here today, uh, if you are not where you need to be in God, and you know that, I would encourage you to admit that to the Lord. I would encourage you to have open lines of communication to the Lord. If there's sin in your life that you are struggling with, I would encourage you to see Him as your Father. And have an open line of communication with Him today. I would encourage you, if you are in a backslidden state, and you know it, but you came today, I want to say, first of all, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And as much as within us, the Lord will help us to embrace you. Okay, I'm glad you're here. Open lines of heaven. Don't pretend like the Lord won't notice if you just go silent. You're His child. You're his son. You're his daughter. And he's still working on you. And believe it or not, he's still working on everybody here today. And so this aspect of spiritual growth in our life needs to be understood as a process. And I think as a church, as a, the culture of our church, I think we've done well in, in some aspects of that. And I think in some aspects the Lord are still working, is still working on us. Uh, and we will do better uh, with His grace and His help. Can I have a big amen? Okay, so let me give you some things to think about in this process of growing. There is, of course, sacrifice. This is being willing to pay a price. There is no true discipleship without being willing to pay a price. It's an illusion. Somewhere there's a consecration in your life. If you don't want to do what I do, there still has to be a consecration in your life. If you don't want to do what the bishop does, there still has to be a con consecration in your life. If you don't want to do what your brother or sister who is zealous they do. There still has to be a consecration. Start somewhere. It's the point and the purpose and the price of discipleship. Also, beyond that, there has to be a sense of 
God's kingdom. Let thy kingdom come. Not my kingdom. God, help us from being selfish Christians who look to see in the church what we need. And the moment the church doesn't meet our need, we go looking for another church. Well, let me tell you a a, a real truth. The next church you find, there's going to be times they don't meet your need also. Are you going to leave them too? And you find you another church. And you wonder why your Christianity always is limited to being inward. It's because there is not this sense of thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Uh, The third idea is this idea of, of trials not being signs of God's displeasure. God help us all to see that. Trials not necessarily a sign of God's displeasure. It may be judgment, but we have far less judgment in this time than there has been in times before. And we have a merciful God. We should not automatically assume that a trial is because God dislikes us or doesn't love us. It may be all preparation. It may be all uh, a a season that will open another door in our life. Number uh, number four, uh, we have to understand the relationship between our consecration, our Christian disciplines, and our future spiritual opportunities. Not in being worthy, but being qualified. We are prepared for a work. We grow in those works. We must, in our Christian growth, have a primacy on the Word of God. The Word of God. No one died for your sins but the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no sanctified text but the Word of God. Not the ruling of a priest. The Word of God. Uh, and, and seven, living our life with uh, eternal values. This is essential and we can often err living short term. So uh, I want to look at these very quickly and speak first about this idea of sacrifice. Let me uh, remind you of a... Christian theologian that I've mentioned to you before. He, he wasn't uh, at the, a reformer in the same manner that we are, uh, turning against historical Christianity in the Roman Catholic Church and coming all the way to an apostolic theology with the idea of doing it like they did in the book of Acts. Or, if you want to be formal, classical, Pentecostal. Uh, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he was a German pastor who, uh, his story is, is, is quite moving to me. I think of all modern theologians, uh, no, one, no one paid a more uh, solemn price for their, 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 their stance. He could have retreated into abstractness. Most theologians in, under the Axis influences retreated into th- abstract theolo- theology. He did not, and when he was warned... Uh, that he would be uh, persecuted and even imprisoned by the Nazis. He did not back down. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, and I will quote from it. Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. It remains an abstract idea, a myth. The disciple places himself at the master's disposal, but at the same time retains the right to dictate his own terms. Notice that. You place yourself at God's disposal, but then you dictate your own terms, a.k.a. uh, free will. But then discipleship is no longer discipleship, but a program of our own to be arranged to suit ourselves. In quote. Uh, Jesus said it like this, and you often hear it. uh, If anyone would be my follower, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. Let him follow me. Matthew 16. Uh, What Christ is doing in the life of the believer and the follower is a process of change and preparation. It is a process where by God uh, prepares us for a work that is in His kingdom and for His purpose. It is a process whereby you become more useful to Him. A process whereby we are prepared to be a tool in the hand of the master craftsman. You can also think of this in terms of a theological understanding and we would call it sanctification. This is where we become more godly over time. The Lord began the work in us and He is going to complete it. Uh, You have to understand if you would think of these terms. You have to understand the influence and the leading of the Holy Ghost in your life. We all need the Holy Ghost. 
Acts 2.38, Peter preached it on the day of Pentecost. Repentance, baptism in water, filled with the Spirit. Acts 2 and 38, and we believe it. We want everyone to receive it. It is God's will for empowering and directing our lives. And that infilling of the Spirit gives us an inner resource. It starts with an experience, and experience is important. Otherwise, the Lord wouldn't give us an experience. Amen. Experience is important, but then it's more than that. And if you think that's all it is, then you're quite shallow in your understanding of the comforter and the work of the comforter in our life. We are led by the Spirit. We are convicted by the Spirit. We are transformed by the Spirit. Yes, you can quench the Spirit. Uh, trials also, as I mentioned, produce this opportunity for growth and understanding. James said it like this, My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy. Wow, what a challenge. When you fall into all sorts of trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect effect so that you will be perfect and complete, not deficit, deficient Excuse me, in any thing. And... So we see the leading of the Spirit. We see the work and, shall I even dare to say, ministry of trials. And finally, we see the the rewards and the celebration, the glory which is to come. Christ showing us, enduring the cross. No one wants a cross. But they understand the point and the purpose. And they have a long-term view which makes it all worth it. This produces in our life growth. It is process. It is change. And we, we must, we must commit ourselves to this, um, as a personal, um, a personal maxim for living, a personal philosophy. We do not resent the process. We embrace the process. You say, oh, that's easy to preach and hard to live. Amen. You said it well. Thank you for saying it. It's still the truth. There is within our life disciplines, disciplines uh, that will produce change in our life. And I will just touch them very, very briefly because I'm, I'm having to edit on the fly. I don't even know if I'll get all my points in. Um, but this is how I do. So uh, the four basic Christian disciplines that all of you and myself included need to pause before we rush on through another week of our 52 that we're given this year. And we need to ask ourselves how we're doing in these areas. And if we're not doing well, we don't need to brush it off. We don't need to be flip. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord and make a vow today to do better. Otherwise, we how are we saying that we are being led by the Spirit? How are we saying that we're being directed by the Spirit? These these four four, uh, disciplines uh, that are so important. Number one, uh, understanding the Word of God is a catalyst for spiritual character, for Christian character and Christian growth. Peter writes this, and yearn like newborn infants for pure spiritual milk so that you might buy it, so that by it you may grow up to salvation. He's referring metaphor to the Word of God. We must not just read the Word of the Lord as a discipline. We must strive to understand it in context and in application. That's not the same thing. I've known people that can quote more Scripture than you ever and I ever can. Today they're not serving the Lord. They can still quote more scripture than I can. But somehow in all of their memorizing, <clears throat> they miss something beneath that. We don't want to do that. We must have the word of the Lord. It's not enough. Hear me. It's not enough to just read and push it out of your mind. You need to let it marinate in you. You need to think about it in the morning. You need to think about it in the afternoon. You need to think about it at night. You need to pray, Lord, I don't want to just read Acts. I want to understand Acts. They're writing at a particular time. They have certain gifts, certain anointings. God forbid. You see, we, we oftentimes just quote Scripture however we want to quote it. It has inspirational value, but that's not how you understand the Word of the Lord. That is to use the Word of the Lord simply as a source of inspiration. And that's fine. But it's not enough just to apply. You can apply a scripture however you want to, however you want to do it. I know about once a month I get a letter or somebody 
uh, from someone, they will write me the most sincere, heartfelt letters, pouring out their hearts, telling me how I don't understand the Word of God. And they always have two or three favorite scriptures, which turn into adoptions. And then, with these ideas, they reinterpret the rest of the Word of God. This is error. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. We must commit ourselves to understanding, not just memorizing. Memorizing is awesome. I don't want to minimize that. Uh, so please don't take it that way. But I'm saying there is more than just the surface reading. There is the humbling of our hearts saying, God, let the word produce something in me. The second thing is prayer. I, uh, I don't need to spend a lot of time on prayer, although we all should spend a lot of time on prayer. Prayer is how you literally humble yourself. Prayer is how you literally ask for God's help. You correct your heart and you straighten out your values through prayer. If your heart isn't right and your values are getting mixed up it's because you haven't been correcting them in prayer the third christian discipline that i want you to think about is the discipline of evangelism it is not just a gift it is a calling it is a discipline and god help every one of us to be committed to personal evangelism it is just as much a discipline in fact in some ways it is a greater imperative Nowhere does Jesus say, go forth and read the word of the Lord in every country. No, he says, go and preach the gospel. That is the, uh, that is the act of evangelism. We preach the gospel. We get that confused sometimes and we preach our favorite uh, interpretation of the book of Daniel. That's not the gospel. We try to get off into being more powerful than somebody. Or more, or more high in a spiritual realm than somebody. That's not the gospel. This is the gospel. You were lost and there was no hope. But the Lord Jesus Christ died and he has a better future for you. And if you will repent, he will fill you with his spirit. He will give you his name. That's the gospel. And God forbid I take it beyond that. I, I, one of the reasons why I'm so careful never to be political in the pulpit. Is because there's enough stumbling blocks between people and the gospel. I don't want to give them one more. We are commanded to preach the gospel. That's why sometimes obscure theological arguments cause more trouble than anything else. They're not the gospel. This is the gospel. I tried to preach it last week. I'm an introducer to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you about someone who can change you. God has something awesome for you. I want to tell you the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is a discipline. That's just as much a discipline as prayer and Bible study. And number four is fellowship. We need one another. Without community, without brotherhood, without support, we are ever so much weaker. Can I have an amen? amen. Next, because I'm rapidly burning my clock down like the fastest burning candle in the history of the world. Uh, I want to talk about the importance of good works of testimony. Uh, it's easy for us to, I would say one of the greatest errors is misunderstanding uh, works. Um, and this is just me and um, I, there's other people who see it differently. Um, and God bless them. I don't want to have a fight. I want them to preach the gospel and I want to preach the gospel. But this issue of good works um, is, is uh, very possible for us to say one thing and then imply something else. But I want to, I want to try, I've tried to think of the simplest way to, to explain this. And this is very much in line, not with just the doctrine of this church over time, but with the manual of the United Pentecostal Church International. And if you don't know, if you doubt that, you should read it. We are not saved by good works. We are saved for good works and if you don't understand that you will get everything twisted up and get back into the idea of of kind of the club idea not the family idea where if people don't manifest your certain set of good works because there's many good works and none of us does all of them okay if they don't do your set of good works then you you find them wanting we are saved for good works, not by good works. Paul says we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
that God prepared beforehand so that we may do them, Ephesians 2. James also says, you see that his faith was working together with his works and his faith was perfected by works. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Works are testimony. Our works glorify God. Our works honor God. Boy, it's quiet. It's all right. It won't bother me more than a minute. I think we all agree with that. Um, if, if you're worried about policing, Brother Nate, some of you are. God bless you. I love you. If you're worried about policing, Brother Nate, you need to read. You need to read. Uh, the, 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 the manual of the United Pentecostal Church International. You need to read the part on salvation and justified by faith. It clearly, clearly states it. It's not just me off in a corner somewhere. We are saved for good works. We are not saved by good works. But good works are signs of maturity. And they're signs of growth. There are signs of getting it, getting that God's kingdom is coming. There are signs of showing that our values are beginning to reflect His values. Does that make sense? It's evidence that we are striving to live a godly and a, a life that is pleasing to God. That's what works are. So it's difficult, and I would say even more, an error for us to talk about how we have this understanding and this prophetic insight and etc etc but we have no testimony of good works in our life no testimony of values that are lining up with God's values no testimony of having charity one to another no testimony of having compassion one to another. No testimony of living by biblical ethics and values like charity and modesty, godliness, long-suffering, fruit of the Spirit, manifesting gifts of the Spirit. Amen. Good works are part of our testimony, and that is part of what God leads us to and perfects in us over time. Uh, the next I- item I want you to think about very quickly, and I'm almost done, is this idea of living the biblical values, not singing them, not preaching them, living biblical values. You say, what do you mean by that? This Word of God is full of principles and spiritual ideals that are pleasing to God, and we can, if we choose, live by them. Them. But if you want to be someone who is led of God, someone who is, who is open to spiritual improvement and growth, you're going to have to do uh, uh, a few things. You're going to have to first understand what these principles of the Word of the Lord are. The, the, uh, and, there's, and yes, to be fair, there are majors and there are minors. You will find this again in the Word of the Lord where people agree to come together. They agree and let's agree on these. And then there's minors. And one of the signs of spiritual immaturity is how people fight over minors rather than agreeing on majors. You see that again and again in the Scripture. But I'm not trying to talk about church politics right now. I'm talking about an individual choice. You have to understand the principles that are pleasing to God. You do. I'm not going to follow you around with a little tablet grading you. If that's the kind of preacher you want, I'm sorry. I'm going to be a huge disappointment to you. This is not a police, a police state. I am not Kim Il Young or whoever, Young Il Sung or some be crazy. I don't know. I'm not. This is not a police state. But if you want to grow in God, you have to have a desire. You have to understand the, the themes whereby I'm going to live. You won't understand them all at once. You start working on one. And if you'll pray, the Lord will convict you. The Spirit will lead you. You start working on that. Principles of preferring one another. Principles of being humble one to another, etc., etc. I, I, I'm running out of time. But you first, you consider 
the opportunity you have how you are going to live. It's your choice. You can ignore it all, come to church. Guess what? We're going to treat you with as much Christian love as we can. But we're going to know the Lord will chasten you because this is a family. Amen. The preacher won't chasten you unless you're in a, some kind of a leadership position whereby you are actively influencing others or you are in a rebellious position where you actively are influencing others to the negative or the anti. Then there is spiritual discipline for that. And the Lord helped me to get that right every time I do it. But that's not how it's going to be. It's going to be in your heart. You're going to have to want. You're going to have to desire. You're going to have to choose. This is a heart thing. Secondly, you're going to have to, to live this word. You're go- when, when a question comes up with you and you agonize over a question, it may be a sign that you're not sure what your values are. Because one of the great advantages of locking down your values is so many of the big decisions in life are already made for you. Because you know what your values are. And number three, uh, something that we're going to have to do is you're going to have to, having first understood... You're going to have to do the hard work of the daily choices in your life whereby you say, I don't want, I, this is not who I want to be. And it's a daily choice. It's not a week at a camp. Thank God for camps. We just had an awesome one. It's not even an awesome Sunday morning altar service. Thank God for those. I want to have an awesome one today. You see what I'm saying? It is a daily choice. It is a daily work where you tell yourself, I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not just nobody. I'm not just an, Amer- an American. I'm not just American. I am a disciple disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and I am going to live my life by the word of God and the final challenge is having done all of that you have to choose and I'm almost done this is it you have to choose to live in trust and faith that's not emotional that's a choice Trouble's going to come. I choose to live in faith. We're all going to go through loss. We all, all of us are mortal. We're all going to face the sickness unto death. We all are going to see loved ones that face tragedy too early. We're all going to have opportunities to get bitter. Before you get really bitter, you'll find yourself working on your personal narrative. Your personal excuse list. And you'll catch yourself there much more than you let yourself get all the way to bitter. Don't weed out your list. Weed it. Don't let yourself build a certain, uh, this litany of disappointment, this litany of unhappiness, this litany of charges against God. If the Lord never does anything for me again, I owe Him everything. I'm going to weed my list because I'm going to choose To be led by the Word of God and to obey the Word of God. Deuteronomy 28. All these blessings will come to you in abundance if you obey the Lord your God. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the sincere hearts here today striving to serve you, striving to honor you. We need your help today from the pulpit to the usher's bench. We need your help today, Lord Jesus, to be true Christians, not just label Christians, but to be true Christians. And without the humbling of ourselves, and without the solemn review of our heart, without an open door to spiritual conviction, then we're going to deceive ourselves and just banny, banter a, a, a label about as though that is the sign when really if we will humble ourselves, you will guide us into all understanding and guide us into all spiritual truth. In Jesus' name, let the church say in Jesus' name. In Jesus. Amen. We'll start a worship service here in just a few minutes as our children join us. God bless you. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Come, worship with us.